is Oxford, England, one of the world's most famous university cities. It's a beautiful, privileged place, steeped in history and studded with hallowed halls. The stylish, honey-coloured buildings of the university's colleges scattered throughout the city wrap around peaceful courtyards that are meticulously manicured and maintained. The oldest colleges date back to the 13th century and little has changed inside these hallowed walls since. The city's famed spires twirl into the sky above. The magnificent architecture of the 38 colleges in the city's medieval centre led to its nickname, the City of Dreaming Spires. There are around 22,000 students studying at Oxford University at any one time. About 42% of the total student body are citizens of foreign countries. Many overseas students study under the Rhodes Scholarship Scheme set up by Cecil Rhodes, a British businessman. These include international leaders like Bill Clinton, President of the United States, Lester Pearson, Prime Minister of Canada, Bob Hawke and Malcolm Turnbull, both Prime Ministers of Australia. Other famous Oxford graduates include Oscar Wilde, Stephen Hawking, J.R. Tolkien, Hugh Grant, C.S. Lewis, Mr. Bean, Rowan Atkinson, Rupert Murdoch, Indira Gandhi, John Wesley and Boris Johnson. These graduates come from different countries and various backgrounds, but they all have one simple thing in common, which is key to their success. They learned how to get the best out of their brains. Today, we're going to discover their secrets. So stay tuned because you will learn fascinating information about the human brain. And you may even discover how to get the most out of your brain as well. Oxford is located about 80 kilometres northwest of London in central southern England and revolves around its prestigious university, which was recently ranked as the best in the world. Oxford University is the oldest university in Britain and the second oldest in the world. Scholars have been studying here for nearly 1,000 years. From the beginning, students organised themselves into halls which soon grew into the modern-day Oxford colleges. These were often supported and sponsored by wealthy individuals who sometimes gave their names to colleges such as Merton and Balliol. There are now 38 colleges in Oxford University located in the city's medieval centre. Oxford University has educated more prime ministers than all other British universities combined. Theresa May, is the 27th occupant of 10 Dowling Street to graduate with an Oxford degree. So too did Britain's only other female Prime Minister, Margaret Thatcher. It's a place of high academic excellence and Oxford students have been among some of the world's highest achievers. And like all high achievers, they've learned how to get the most out of their brain. The bottom line, mankind's greatest achievements are possible only because of the human brain. It's been said that you can manage something effectively only when you can identify, label and describe it. But how does one do that with the brain? Well, today's guest, a brain function specialist, can help us figure this out. Dr. Arlene Taylor is the founder and president of Realizations Inc., a non-profit corporation that engages in brain function research and provides unique educational resources. She's the author of several popular books related to brain function and practical applications to relationships and everyday living, and creator of the Longevity Lifestyle Matters program. In our program, How to Find Your Natural Abilities, our guest will share with us aspects of your brain's cognitive or thinking bent. Let's meet 
Dr. Taylor. Dr. Taylor, welcome to The Incredible Journey. We're so glad you're on our program today. I'm glad I'm on your program too, Gary. Thank you for inviting me. Dr. Taylor, the research shows that our brains have a bent and you emphasize this strongly. Can you please explain to us what that actually means? Well, it means on our planet with however many billions of people we have, every one of them has a bent. In terms of brain function, the word bent is very, very positive. It really means that every single brain has a special uniqueness, a special talent, some innate giftedness. Some people have more than one, but everybody has at least one. And if you can identify what your bent is and you hone that, you can achieve high levels of skill, high levels of competence. Enjoy what you do because following your bent tends to be energy efficient. You don't use as much energy as you do with other types of activities. It allows you to develop a higher level of skill. You can become more competent in anything that involves that bent. And currently, the wisdom is that if you could match 51% of all the tasks you do somehow to your bent, you would be healthier, happier, likely more successful, and might even live longer. So what's so important about this thinking brain bent? Well, Gary, I can give it to you in two words. Energy consumption. Everything we do takes energy. When you are working within your brain bent, you are expending less energy, which makes it last longer, if you will. PET scan studies by Dr. Richard Hayer suggests that probably each brain has an innate energy advantage. And what does that mean? It means that you can do some tasks more easily and energy efficiently than others. I can do some tasks more easily and energy efficient than others. And that's why we need to work together because we have different bents and it is all about energy consumption. Naturally, the brain prefers to do energy efficient tasks because it knows how much energy it's using even if you haven't identified that. And interestingly enough, it will try to push you to procrastinate the types of tasks that are not energy efficient that take lots more energy. So figure this out for yourself and you know how to use your energy by design in terms of energy consumption. If you're doing a task that is not part of your brain bent, it's a task that is more energy exhausting for your brain, you're gonna have some consequences. First of all, your brain's gonna need more glucose. It's going to use more fuel. Secondly, it's gonna need more oxygen. It already takes 20% of all the oxygen that you breathe in and that gets into your bloodstream. It needs more oxygen. It gets exhausted quicker. A little bit of that task is much more tiring than a lot of a task that primarily is driven by your brain bent. You don't think as quickly because it doesn't cross the synapse as quickly. And bottom line is you get irritable because the brain is trying to tell you, this is really not working well for me. So you can watch people doing different tasks and you can observe them getting more and more irritable <laughs> as the brain gets more and more fatigued. So it's real. My guess is that most people have been led to believe that procrastination is a bad thing. This sounds, after listening to what you've just said, as if the brain is trying to be energy wise. Well, I would say so, Gary. If you pay attention to what needs to be done in life and what your brain tries to make you procrastinate, don't need to do it at all or do it later, that will give you some idea of the type of tasks that the brain does but requires more energy. 
And now you can manage that because some things I have to do for which I have no innate bent, no giftedness whatsoever. I still have to do them. But I sandwich them in between things that are energy efficient and energy effective for my brain so that I don't get too exhausted. Because the brain does not store unlimited amount of energy. It doesn't have unlimited energy banks. Some research suggests that you only have about enough glucose in your brain to power it for about 10 minutes. And so it's continually dependent on the bloodstream bringing you fresh supplies of fuel, which is glucose, oxygen, micronutrients like vitamins and minerals and enzymes. So identifying, at least to some degree, your brain's energy advantage and matching a little over half, I say 51%, just more than less, of the tasks for which you do have some energy advantage can enhance your competency. You can develop higher levels of skill. Uh, it can improve your health. We've done some studies that show that people who do a lot of adapting, meaning they spend hours and hours and hours doing tasks for which they have no bend, Often, if they do that for several years, they can really get sick. They can develop some stress-related illnesses because it's stressful for the brain to do most of the work it has to do in areas for which it has no bend. Mm -hmm. And so you potentially can extend your life by doing this. And it's not that hard to do. You look at all the tasks you have to do. You figure out which ones are most energy efficient for your brain, and then you sandwich the ones in that take more time and energy so that you're not just totally exhausted at the end of five hours, and now you don't even have any energy to do the fun things that we also need to do in life. So how does one go about doing this? Identifying what your brain procrastinates, for example. <laughs> Well, there are some assessments that are available that can give you a jump start. But you simply ask yourself, when I look at the tasks that I'm doing today, this week, whatever, which ones do I find myself putting off or I would put them off if I thought I had the choice? Now you write down those. And eventually you begin to see a pattern. You know, I look forward to doing this. I could do this task longer. Oh, if I didn't have to do this task at all, it would be wonderful. And so on. I'll give you one example in my life. Balancing my checkbook is really energy intensive for my brain. And for years, I would struggle and I'd procrastinate. And then I'd have to do several months at a time. And that means if there was a mistake somewhere, I would be behind the eight ball for several months. And I finally said, my brain really doesn't like to do this. It's exhausted. I'm going to trade somebody. And for several years, I'd been cutting one of our neighbor person's hair because I'd cut hair my whole life, starting with my own. Didn't do a good job on that first haircut when I was about three so I said, look, I'll cut your hair anytime you want. If once a month you'll balance my checkbook, the answer was deal. I don't like to cut my hair. I don't like to pay for it. Okay, that's great. It works for both of us. So here's the kicker. Many people have learned to do very well tasks that do not match their brain bend, either because that's what was emphasized at home and they were made to do it, or their job requires it and they don't have a lot of options for income. It's not what you have learned to do well. As my kids used to say, read my lips, mom. <laughs> it's not what you've learned to do well. It's what your brain does energy efficiently, meaning you don't dread doing it and you're not totally wiped out when you've spent an hour doing that. The second thing you can ask yourself is, when I do this task, how exhausted am I at the end? Do I feel like I, if I could, I'd just like to go to bed? Or do I still have energy? 
And the third thing you can ask yourself is when I'm doing these different tasks, which task ends up the one that I make the most mistakes while I'm doing it? Because if it's not energy efficient, you just tend to make more mistakes. So the goal is to become a little more aware of what's going on in your brain so you know how to work with it more efficiently. So Dr. Taylor, whereabouts in the brain is this energy advantage located? Who knows? <laughs> it may be in different parts of the brain, but at this point, what we believe is that you can think about it and manage your energy and evaluate your energy in the third brain layer where you have conscious thought. So as a reminder, you can describe the brain in three layers. Your wrist as the first brain layer. There's no conscious thought there. Make this hand into a fist. That's the limbic system. Again, no conscious thought. Put this hand over the top, and there's your neocortex, that third brain layer. You can actually see that on a brain model. Your other hand represents this whole part here, this rind on the watermelon, if, if you will. Now, this third layer is divided by natural fissures into two hemispheres, right hemisphere and left hemisphere, which is about the size of your brain. And if you look at the screen, you can see a drawing of that. Each hemisphere also has a fissure it gives us four chunks of cerebral tissue. And way back in the, what, 5th century BC, something like that, Hippocrates said the brain has four chunks of tissue, four divisions. Don't know how he figured that out. And you can see that now we have brain scans. The brain has four chunks of tissue in that third layer. He named them, starting at the top left, the choleric, sanguine, melancholy, and phlegmatic. Some people talk about the left frontal, the right frontal, the left posterior, the right posterior. That's confusing for some people, so I just renamed them with key functions. So what he called the choleric division, I call the prioritizing division what he called the sanguine division. It's the visualizing, making pictures in your mind, imagining. What he called the melancholy, I call the harmonizing division. It's the part that wants relationships with each other, with nature, with whatever. And what he called phlegmatic, I call the maintaining division because that part of the brain develops routines and follows them over and over and over again so you can do it the same way all the time. So within those four chunks, we have some conscious thought and are able to evaluate energy. How much are we expending? How tired am I? And so we are at least processing this in that part of the brain. And my guess is that the energy advantage may be there as well because it impacts our thinking ability, and that's where we consciously think. Dr. Taylor, this has been so fascinating, relevant, and helpful. Thank you for being with us today. It's my pleasure, Gary. I just love talking about the brain. Dr. Arlene Taylor has certainly given us a lot of valuable information and much to think about, and that includes discovering our brain bent, what we're good at, and where our talents lie. To us today, the word talent refers to a person's natural ability to be very good at something. Talent refers to an above average ability, an extraordinary ability, like a talent to sing or learn or paint or excel in sport. But the only reason this word is in our dictionary today is because Jesus used it in a story or parable that he told. Jesus' parable of the talents is found in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 to 30. In this parable, Jesus describes how a wealthy master entrusted talents 
to three of his servants. Now, a talent was a huge amount of money. It was worth about 20 years wages for a common laborer. So it was serious money, probably millions of dollars. But in Jesus' parable, he was clearly using this large unit of money symbolically, figuratively, to refer to any God-given talent we're entrusted with, including our abilities. This concept became so widely and commonly taught in England during the Middle Ages that the word talent was adopted into the English language to mean our natural abilities. Listen to how Jesus started his story, his parable, in Matthew chapter 25, verses 14 and 15. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his servants and delivered his goods to them. And he gave one five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. So Jesus tells this story about a wealthy man preparing to leave on a journey who entrusts three of his servants with talents, a lot of money. He gives one five talents, another two, and another one talent. And he expects the servants to invest those talents wisely and well so that they'll be able to provide him with a good return on his investments when he gets back from his journey. All we're told is that the master apportioned the amounts to each of the servants according to their ability. While the master is gone, the five talent and two talent servants invest their talents diligently and wisely. And they receive a 100% return on their investments. But the one talent servant just buries his talent. He does absolutely nothing to develop or grow his talent. So there's no increase on his master's investment. The opportunity's lost, gone forever. So when the master returns, he commends and rewards the five and two talent servants. But the one talent servant who did nothing with his talent is rebuked and punished. Now, Jesus is telling us something very important here. We've all been given or entrusted by God with something of value. In fact, everything we have is given to us by God. Now, although this parable refers to money, it has a far wider application and can teach us a lot about work, success, wealth, and yes, even our brains. Some believe this parable aligns with brain bent and our natural talents and abilities. Every brain has some unique talents and it's important that we identify and develop them because as the parable indicates, it's either use it or lose it. If you want to make the most of your natural abilities and talents that God has given you and experience the fulfillment and happiness associated with developing the gifts that God has given you, why not ask for His guidance and blessing right now as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, thank You for Your love and goodness to us. We recognize that all we have comes from You. You are the giver of all good gifts. And so we thank you for the talents and natural abilities you have given each one of us. Lord, we want to be good stewards and use these talents diligently and wisely. We wish to experience the fulfillment and happiness associated with developing the gifts that you have given us. So please bless and guide each and every one of us. And thank you for the greatest gift of all, Jesus. We wish to accept and follow him and ask all this in His holy name, Amen. Every brain has unique talents and is something special. Today, we've been reminded that if we don't use it, we lose it. So take good care of your brain. You only have one and replacements are unavailable. If you're interested in finding out more about your natural abilities or your brain's bent and how to make the most of them, then I'd like to recommend the free gift we have for all our viewers today. It's the booklet entitled Bible Secrets to Unlocking the Genius Within. 
and a self-assessment guide to help you identify your natural abilities and talents. This booklet and assessment is our gift to you and is absolutely free. There are no costs or obligations whatsoever. So make the most of this wonderful opportunity to receive the special gift we have for you today. Here's the information you need. Phone or text us at 0436 or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer and we'll send it to you totally free of charge and with no obligation. So don't delay. Call or text 0436 333 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's offer. Write to us at P.O. Box 5101 Dora Creek, New South Wales, 2264 Australia or P.O. Box 76673 Manukau, Auckland, 2241 New Zealand. Don't delay. Phone or text 0436 333 in Australia or 020 422 2042 in New Zealand or visit our website www.tij.tv to request today's free offer. Call or text us now. If you've enjoyed our journey to Oxford, and our reflections on your brain and the importance of discovering your natural abilities, be sure to join us again next week when we will share another of life's journeys together. Until then, remember the ultimate destination of life's journey. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth, and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain for the former things have passed away.